Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the world this week. We are in the company of Vivian Walt of Time Magazine. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to uh, Mark Burley of the French news agency AFP, Andreas Evagora of Eurosport, and uh, Judah Grunstein of World Politics a Review. It's been what a roller coaster <coughs> week for Greece. The clock ticking down to an end of month debt deal deadline. <coughs> Now, earlier they were, uh, on Monday night, there was a sudden late night meeting in Germany uh, that had all the main creditors inside of the same room to come up with their latest final proposal. And by Wednesday, some even dared to claim that there was light at the end of the tunnel. Tout doit être fait dans des conditions qui respectent le peuple grec, mais qui respectent aussi les règles. People, the Greek citizens, while respecting, abiding by the rules adopted at the European level, so that a solution can be negotiated that will stand the trials of time. All right, uh, François Hollande there saying that uh, uh, he expected that there could be a breakthrough within hours. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, Greece since deciding to withhold 300 million euros it owed the IMF by this Friday, instead employing a tactic last used by Zambia in the 1980s called bundling. Uh, Alexis Tsipras uh, going further and calling that uh, uh, proposal by creditors absurd. Again, Andreas Evagora, the clock ticking, and uh, we're approaching this June 30th deadline there the sums are one and a half billion euros. Uh, could we sleepwalk into something ominous? Well, it gives a whole new meaning to the, the, the phrase, the checks in the post, doesn't it? I mean, we're expecting a payment today. It's now going to be the end of the month. And as you've said, this happened before with, with Zambia. I mean, the Greeks are a proud people. No disrespect to the African country, but the fact that they're now in the same economic boat as Zambia will be embarrassing to them. This doesn't really affect the underlying issues, which is a huge black economy. In, uh, in Greece, uh, related to that, obviously uh, not much in the way of tax revenues, uh, an economy that's faltering, and despite what I think the French president says, very publicly um, making the Greek people pay, making them suffer, to make sure this doesn't happen anywhere else. And, and what's happening at the moment in terms of uh, public services in Greece is, is, is really very awful now. We're, we're, we're in a state where the country is, is uh, very close to collapse on that side of things. You're saying that they're still trying to punish Athens, the creditors? Oh, I think, I think they are. I mean, look at what's happening in terms of the fact that uh, health care is, is collapsing, the fact that public services in general are, are, are almost absent. It seems that the, uh, the, I mean, just look at the hatred, literally, I, I, I use that word carefully, but for the IMF in Greece. I mean, when Christian Lagarde goes there, the, the, the security is amazing. There are these decoys to make sure the protesters can't get anywhere near her or anyone from the IMF. It's almost a state of war for some people there. I, I think they're not really necessarily because it's Greece, but they don't want this to happen in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy. Uh, and this is the best way of preventing it, it's just to see how much you can, you can punish uh, one country, which is the case for Greece. We've said it before, it's either a Grexit or more austerity. There's no other choices for them. All right, some putting the onus on Athens. Uh, we have uh, one viewer on Twitter telling us Greece has conducted the negotiations in a way that makes it harder for the EU to compromise with them. Judah Grunstein. Yes, there were, I mean, when, when uh, Tsipras and the Syriza coalition were elected uh, and on a program to end austerity, uh, there was definitely an opportunity. There's definitely room for the Troika to, to maneuver, to give a little more than they're doing right now. They've already compromised a little bit and given, uh, a, allowing Greece to keep a little bit more of their primary budget surplus uh, to, to uh, pay for some social, social spending. Uh, but if all the reports of the, that first week or two weeks of the initial meetings between the new Greek government uh, and the, the Europeans uh, were that the Greeks were almost amateurish in terms of being completely unprepared, uh, talking about having proposals that they didn't have that were very vague, um, and just not being at all prepared for how business is done 
at the European Union level, where everything is very structured, very prepared in terms of documents and, and uh, briefings and things like that. But do you need sometimes to think outside the box to hammer home the point that Andreas well, was I, making, which is you can't dis the, the, dismantle a whole social fabric of a country? The, the, this is where it becomes. It would. This is where it's. It's. It would be comic if it weren't so tragic in the sense that. Uh, I mean, apparently, for instance, between the German and the Greek uh, finance ministers, it was almost a visceral hatred uh, that has almost translated into a European position of, of a really rigid position, almost vindictive, in the sense that everyone knows that Greece cannot pay back its debts. There's absolutely no doubt, mathematically, all the economists that, that look at it understand that. And it's a question of structuring something that, again, makes gives uh, Greece some, some oxygen to survive, uh, while also maintaining this image that uh, that people have to pay, the countries have to pay back their debts so that it won't happen again. I do believe that the Europe, that the EU, that the Troika had a lot more options available to them, and that it almost because of the personal friction they didn't do it. And what it's become now is two two people holding grenades, uh, threatening they're going to pull the pin. Uh, but uh, the, obviously the the either way. Uh, the outcome of, of Greece defaulting or exiting the Eurozone would be ca catastrophic for both sides. Uh, some people are trying to minimize the impact it would have on Europe uh, to, to maybe to, to boost well, that, the negotiating that, position, but that's I, a, that's I don't an interesting think that's point accurate. Because uh, um, Vivian Walt, we had one columnist on earlier this week who says that Cyprus may have an unwitting ally in David Cameron, that the EU can't afford to have both a Grexit and a Brexit Cyprus knows it and the Europeans know it too. Look, obviously a Brexit would be much more drastic for the European economy than Greece exiting the euro, although Britain is not in the eurozone. But, you know, Greece is 11 million people and it, I believe its GDP is about 3% of the EU's GDP. So you're dealing with a tiny rounding but the, but the argument really. again has always been that once you set that precedent of somebody leaving the eurozone so psychological. You, you start to unravel perhaps the this idea of a europe that grows bigger and bigger that is true but then we're still in the realm of what of, of like you know psychological battle of wills which is what you know judah was saying that basically increasingly over the last five months you've had two sides that just haven't been willing to yield. You can understand Cyprus's point of view. He has to sell this package to a country that is already on its knees, that has been suffering really, you know, material pain for years now. Just suffering because it wants to stay in the euro. What is it? Two out of three uh, Greek voters want to stay in the euro. But I mean, what, there's now word that suggestions that maybe they'll go to an election or a referendum, maybe, because. You, the government basically has to sort of say, do you want us to keep our promise to roll back austerity or do you want to stay in the euro? It's an either or situation. And you can't have both. So basically, uh, you know, if a referendum or elections happen, it has to come down to, OK, you want to stay in the euro so badly, you're in for more pain. And, and on that score, uh, one of the German newspapers billed picking up on the fact that um, uh, Alexei Tsipras uh, has also been on the phone to Vladimir Putin of Russia. He gets everywhere. On that, on, on that score, is, he, is Tsipras hedging his bets in a small Plan way? Plan B, isn't it? If, if they do leave, they're going to need backers somewhere. And I guess China and Russia, to some extent, will step up. I mean, it's, it's not even totally certain that Greece leaving the Eurozone would mean le uh, leaving the European Union. There is a possibility of having to leave and then coming straight back in, but not as a Eurozone member. There's a whole lot of different scenarios that could be at play there. And there are small European Union members who don't have the euro and they survive. And there are also some ones on the periphery, that, you know, Serbia or Turkey, not so small. But, you know, there is there is a possible possibility for survival. I mean, I, I think at this point what we're seeing now where they don't seem to have the money to pay 300 million um, into the IMF, or they're giving that impression anyway, maybe, you know, they really have to look carefully at how badly do they want to stay in the euro? Is it worth all of this pain? Well, it's been five years, hasn't it? Five years of austerity is a long time. And so we should make it another five years? <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, you talked about this being a very small part of Europe. For China, it's probably absolutely minuscule. I mean, China could come and save Greece tomorrow, and it would you know, they barely realise it. So you can't really blame Greece for looking around the world. The country's on its knees. They're, they're desperate. They need some help from, from somewhere, whether it's Russia or, or China. 
it's also it's five years of austerity after uh, on an economy that contracted by what twenty five percent or something like that. I mean, the the does. actual human scale of suffering in, increases is, is is real, and Cyprus is the one who has to who who's accountable to it. Um, again, uh, the the. The EU had had a lot of room for maneuver, and I think that in some ways, because of the the kind of rhetoric that Syriza used, that Cyprus and uh, and and the coalition used in coming into power, sort of made the 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 Troika dig in their heels, uh, uh, all three of them to to various degrees. There's been some give, but the real question is how much how much oxygen there is, is Greece going to have to 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 spend spend on it on its people. Vivian Wall. I mean, it's just hard to know what's going to happen in the next three weeks to really turn this around. I mean, what is going to happen that will allow Greece to pay back one and a half billion at the end of June in a way that doesn't completely cripple them? Um, it's hard to know. It's not like they're suddenly getting a windfall from somewhere else. Um, and uh, it would seem to me that, like, you know, the Troika has not played its hand very well, as Judah says. Um, they've backed themselves into a corner. And at some point, they're going to have to move beyond this kind of, uh, you know, game of chicken and, um, and, and s sit down and say, OK, we bail this country out. The real problem is it highlights a fundamental weakness of the euro, which is that it's as strong as its weakest link. And uh, its weakest link is also maybe its most irrelevant link as well. All right. Hard stopping debt negotiations with Greece, a bruising election campaign in Turkey. The president himself coming down from his perch to campaign. And with good reason, if Recep Tayyip Erdogan gets a super majority in parliament, he'll be able to change the constitution to take on more powers. Standing in his way, one of the smaller opposition parties, the Kurdish based HDP of Selahattin Demirtas, which this time is running as a block throughout the country. If it garners 10% nationally, Erdogan's dream will be thwarted. If it fails, it gets zero seats in the next parliament. Double or nothing with accusations, lawsuits, riots, the murder of a campaign bus driver by unknown assailants, and the usual mudslinging by all comers. They're wasting money. They're saying money paid for official cause is not even peanuts in the Turkish economy. But they're giving nothing to laborers. They're even using golden toilets in government buildings, and they're giving nothing to poor people. Hey, Kilic Tarulu. Since when have you been visiting the toilets of the presidential palace? Did you clean the toilet seats? All right, he even, he even challenged him to come and find the golden toilet, which uh, that, that offer was not taken upon. Uh, There'd be a lot of rooms to look through. Apparently, there's yeah. 1,100 rooms in the place. I don't know how many bathrooms. But. Uh, Mark Burley, uh, this, is, uh, this has been billed as the most important election campaign in Turkey mm -hmm. since 1950. Well, certainly, if, if it turns out Erdogan's uh, sort of gamble, yeah, I mean, uh, you've got a guy who is uh, very much concentrating power or wanting to concentrate power in his hands. And, uh, you know, some of the things that have come out that then he's had crushed in various ways. You know, he, he comes down very hard on on uh, foreign media. You, I think he blasted away at the New York Times yesterday. Or and to, The Economist and The Guardian. And the Econ yeah, he comes down on anybody who dares to, to scrutinize too closely. I mean, I, I think that's a worry for any any uh, a, a democracy uh, yeah i think i think it's a fairly big test of democracy for for turkey biggest in 50 years i don't know and and uh, in the domestic uh, the domestic press scene is is uh, horrendous also in terms of imprisoning uh, journalists uh, that criticize the government or disagree but in in a lot of ways erdogan is is sort of like the set bladder model in the sense that uh, he's just overseen a, a tremendously successful economy uh, that is, I think, tripled, if I'm not mistaken, the average income of, of uh, the over the past 10 or 15 years. So uh, he 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 remains very popular. He's got that sort of. Uh, he used to be the mayor of Istanbul. He's got that mayoral political ap approach of just keeping people happy, keeping the economy going. And uh, in the meantime, though, there's been a real slide in terms of uh, this illiberal approach to democracy, silencing uh, opponents, and and uh, and just the. The rhetoric is just very violent in terms of uh, the, the way he the way he talks to the to a crowd. He, he used the same kind of uh, 
uh, very violent, aggressive rhetoric when there were the Gezi Park uh, protests two years ago. All right, one reaction on Twitter from Gary. Uh, Turkey's elections this coming Sunday do not promise much hope for Western values and interests. And yet, when you speak to Turks, they say they'll go along with what Erdogan is saying until the economy gets too bad, in which case they won't put up with it. Yes, and, you know, talking about Western values, this is an elect, this is a very, you know, feisty election. And in that sense, it certainly is Western values and interests. The result might not be what, you know, the West likes, but... Um, but then it's not the West, it's Turkey. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, the West? I mean, this, isn't this another Middle East kind of strong man emerging? We've seen it in so many other countries. And what's interesting, what you were saying, I, I, I didn't think a, a president of Turkey was even supposed to be involved in politics. They're supposed to be above yes. this kind of electioneering. But I, I saw that uh, he has more, he's had more TV time than all the other candidates combined which is a key question. He's not even supposed, he's not on the ballot, obviously, uh, in, in this election, yet he is the, the focus of the whole election, which is, is interesting to yeah. me. I mean, what's interesting is that it's sort of been, the election has been cast as, as being a kind of make or break for changing the system and making this a presidential country. But in fact, he's been doing that already for the last several years. Um, well, and, there seems to be attrition has happening. I mean, there are only two, last poll I saw was talking about 42% maybe in favour. It's fine, they'll come out as the biggest party, but with a lot less than the majority they're hoping for. And he's not an old man, he's 61, right? He's got a lot of years ahead of him. He was, he was sick too, I think, uh, yeah. a few years ago. I mean, the, the interesting thing about European values too is that uh, there was a period of time where the Turkish accession uh, candidacy to the European Union was driving a lot of democratic reforms and a lot of press freedom reforms. Uh, and at, a, in, at around the period 2004, 2005, uh, when it started becoming really clear in Turkey that no matter what they did, they were not going to join the European Union, uh, the, the, you started seeing a lot more of this backsliding going on. And, and I, I think the other interesting thing... So it's the EU that turned their backs first on Turkey, is what you're saying? Uh, there, there's an argument to be made. I mean, the, 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 the EU has always prided itself on having that, that sort of leverage and infra influence to, 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 uh, uh, to promote U European norms, and it was happening in Turkey. And when it became clear that uh, the, the candidacy was going to go nowhere, uh, I mean, the, the other thing that's interesting, too, about Turkey, Turkish democracy is the way in which the debate around it has changed in, in the last 10 years, because uh, the AKP, which is a, a moderate Islamist party, was always held up as this model, this proof that political Islam is compatible with democracy. Um, and uh, Erdogan, for instance, was a, was a strong supporter of Mohamed Morsi in Egypt, uh, the, 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 brother, the Muslim Brotherhood government there. And, and as uh, Erdogan has sort of backslid into this sort of populist, bully-type politician, the, the, the Islamist element has receded. And you see him being compared more to Putin, to Viktor Orban in Hungary, and to just the, the sort of run-of-the-mill populist uh, demagogue uh, type, of, uh, type of leader. So uh, I think in the West, and I think in the region, he's still very much seen the Islamists, the whole thing about putting mosques in universities and headscarves and all the rest of it. It's, it's a worry for Iranians, I know that. But you don't see the, you don't see the concern, yes, in the West of the, the, the driving factor being Islamism. The driving factor seems to be Erdogan's thirst ego. for power. And all right. ego. Another uh, really searing question that we've been asking ourselves this week is, have the French lost their romantic touch? Love does not conquer all, certainly not the folks in the maintenance department at Paris City Hall. They've taken the pliers to those love locks that have sprouted on bridges, not just in Paris, by the way, in many European capitals. Too heavy a load for the structure, they say. Vivian Walt, what's your religion on love locks? Thank God they're gone. <laughs> Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I'm no less romantic than the next person. But, but um, <laughs> they were unsightly. Well, hands up how many people have actually gone to put their love lock on the bridge. Probably none of us, right? This is a thing for tourists. Um, for Parisians, I think it began to be irksome, not only because it was kind of an eyesore, but also because it was seen as sort of um, tourists really having taken over... Um, a whole part of central Paris um, in a way that just was bothersome on a whole lot of different levels. This happened to be one of the most obvious visual signs of it. But, I mean, I, I, it, it just so happens that a couple of weeks ago with some friends, we were trying to figure out how long it would take to do to mount a guerrilla commando 
assault on the bridge and get rid of all the locks. And, oh, so uh, this is something you fantasized about. We 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 were talking about I when, you were whether romantic it would be kind possible. of guy. That is romantic. I, well, I am, but action. you know, I, I don't really, I don't. It's, I agree. It's it's sort of this sort of art. It's this very artificial. Uh, it's become a tourist trap. It's become just another Disneyland attraction, and that's not what the French tourism model is. That's not what Paris is. The fact is that most of the most of the locks weren't even attached to the bridge anymore. There's so apparently there are a hundred thousand locks, uh, several tons of weight. And the the you walk along that bridge, and there's locks upon locks upon locks, and the last one or two or three or four layers from the bridge. Um, so no, I, I I found it more of an eyesore, and uh, I guess I got a little curmudgeonly seeing it over and over every time you it, you it, walked across the bridge, someone attaching the lock, and you just sort of wondering. Well, we're, we're very lucky. It's a tricky. It's a tricky one, the Mark. The one, Mark we're, because we're, we're very lucky. We live here, and so we this is our city, so we do that. But you know, this broadcast goes out around the world, and just had my brother visiting from Australia and all the rest of it. And people want to appropriate a city uh, during a visit to be part of them. Now they do it with selfies, they do it with photos, and in this case, they want to <clears throat> leave a love lock. Now, you know, I, as a resident, totally against it. I found it an eyesore, but I totally understand why people wanted to leave a trace of them in the world's most romantic city. A final word on well, this. And, Andres, does, does it play to the stereotype that the French aren't always welcoming? Well, there's stereotypes everywhere. Yes, they're ugly, it's dangerous, but think of the fish. I mean, you were talking about the Paris City Council. Mm -hmm. They've done a great job in cleaning up the Seine putting marine life back in. There are, what, 10,000 um, keys floating around the boat, 100,000 keys yeah. floating about around. That's reason enough to, uh, to stop the practice, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, dear. We have unanimity on the love locks <laughs> issue here. Uh, we're going to leave it there, Andrea Sevagora. More love, less locks. More love, less <laughs> locks. Okay, Judah Grunstein playing catch up there. Thank you very much. I also want to thank Mark Burley and Vivian Walt. Stay with us, though, because it's our Media Watch segment now. And we're joined by Emma James. Emma, you, you, you heard the, 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 the verdict here from our panel. Yeah. Ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it does reflect how people are reacting because it seems like those people who live in Paris are saying goodbye and good riddance, whereas everyone who either has visited Paris or wants to visit Paris in the future is saying, oh, it's a terrible shame. So it's quite interesting that, that really that was reflected here because certainly that's what I've been seeing. Even the US comedian Bette Midler has been getting involved in this one. She tweeted this earlier today. Uh, Paris is removing all love locks from the Pont des Arts. They're worried the bridge will collapse from the weight of failed relationships, <laughs> which I think is rather a nice one because, as, as we alluded to a, a few moments ago, uh, probably these padlocks last far longer than a lot of the relationships that they are uh, supposed to be celebrating. Um, looking elsewhere, we've got uh, mixed reactions, according to this Twitter user, to Paris's new look Pont des Arts. Uh, Smart street art replaces love locks until the glass is ready. Uh, so you've got love is the key there. Mm. Um, this Twitter user, I think that he's trying to say he is for the street art, but he doesn't really make it that clear. He's basically saying, um, you know, do you really regret, regret those uh, awful padlocks now? I don't know that that street art makes me think... No, I think he's being ironic. <laughs> he doesn't like the street art. <laughs> well... I don't think many people do. It does seem to have got a resounding thumbs down. Yeah. Um, elsewhere, what I was looking at, I had never realised that it was such a recent phenomenon. I thought this was something that had been going on for decades here in Paris. Um, and when you see the numbers of padlocks on there, your mind automatically kind of assumes that. But when we take a look at this article on BuzzFeed, and there's one of the panels being lifted away, they actually refer to the fact that this really only started happening within the last decade. In fact, they've got these images. That's how it looked very recently, and you can see all the, uh, the sort of gold glittering um, on the bridges there. But if you swipe across the picture, that's what it looked like just in 2009. So this is very, very recent, this obsession with creating a lasting memorial to one's love. On and a, a memorial that you see in other European capitals. Yes. Well, interestingly, um, the Wall Street Journal talks about that. And it says that there are other cities that have taken to this idea of 
padlocking things as a way of showing enduring love. But no other city really seems to have embraced it to quite the same extent as Paris, perhaps because Paris is just seen as such a romantic destination. Um, but what they also talk about is where this idea came from. And that, according to them, it comes from an Italian teen novel, which was written uh, in 2006 called I Want You. Uh, and in that novel, two lovers uh, in Rome padlock um, something on the, the river, over the river Tiber, throw the key into the, the, the river, and that's supposedly where this whole idea has sprung from. Um, but they also highlight what happened to some of the padlocks that were removed a few years back. Uh, and it was an artist, Laurie Gréau, who was the lucky recipient, if you like, of these, uh, well, I think it was 100,000 locks he was given, or maybe it's 10,000. Um, he created this. It's called Tainted Love. It's a little hard to make out what it is. I'm not sure that it's any better when you can see it clearly, to be honest. He's melted them down mm. and created these kind of shards and put them in plexiglass. And it, it's not really my taste. Um, but, you know, some people like it. Um, this particular review of it says it symbolizes undying love. Um, but does this transformation take away the meaning of these objects or does it solidify it? I just think, frankly, it's a little ugly, but there you go. Perhaps slightly less ugly than the actual padlocks on the bridge itself. All right, and Andreas Evagor making the uh, argument for saving the fish that are, in there below, <laughs> that are below the bridge. Emma James, I want to thank you. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here for The World This Week.